the Kiowa Six and other Native American history topics. Uh, this is a collaboration between the Office for Diversity and Inclusion and the Art Department, one of first of many of our collaborations to introduce in our permanent collection. We have a pretty large collection of prints by the Kiowa Six and our speaker, Dr. Ashley Espinal, will talk about who this Kiowa Six are. Uh, my name is Dr. Kelly LaFramboise. I'm the Director for Diversity and Inclusion. I want to welcome you all. Afterwards, we have a reception with cookies and drinks, and we invite you to view in the gallery the art prints and sign your name in the book. Before we begin today's talk, though, I want to read VCSU's land acknowledgement statement. We hereby acknowledge that the VCSU campus sits on traditional and ancestral lands of the Red Lake and Pembina bands of Ojibwe and the Sisseton and Wapitan bands of Santee Dakota peoples. This land is deeply connected to the many indigenous peoples who have held and continue to hold it sacred. We pledge to work toward a strong and lasting relationship with Ojibwe and Dakota tribes, as well as other indigenous peoples of our region to hold this land and community in celebration of its rich cultural history. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ashley Espinal. Before I read her formal bio, I would just like to say that I'm really proud to have her here. We went to grad school together and we took a lot of art history and anthropology classes together. And when I first became hired at VCSU and Professor Mirso was unpacking a bunch of Kiowa Six art prints from a storage closet. And I was like, why do we have Kiowa Six prints here? <laughs> It began a long then journey to having um, Dr. Espinal join us because uh, the University of Oklahoma, where we went to grad school together, has one of the nation's strongest Native American art history programs, and that's um, where we met and took classes. And as soon as I said, we have Kiowa Six prints, I said, I got to call Ashley and tell her that we have these prints. And so that's how we got to have um, Dr. Espinal join us today virtually. Dr. Espinal joined the Whitney Art Museum, Whitney Western Art Museum in November of 2021 as a curatorial assistant. Before joining the Whitney, Dr. Espinal completed an MA in Art and Museum Studies at Georgetown University in 2010, and her doctorate in Native American Art History at the University of Oklahoma in 2019. She served as an Art History Adjunct Instructor from 2019 to 2020 for both the University of Oklahoma and Bacon College. Additionally, Espinal has held numerous internships at museums throughout the country, including the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, the Denver Art Museum, and the Fred Jones Jr. Mu Museum of Art at the University of Oklahoma. Espinal's area of focus is contemporary Native arts, and her research and curatorial work merge the disciplines of art history, visual culture, cultural cultural memory, and museology. She's particularly interested in how knowledge is stored and transmitted through art, and how this enables history to be visually written through art and objects. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Espinal for her talk. All right, hello everyone. I just wanted to say thank you so much to Kelly and to Angela for this warm virtual welcome. I am so sorry that I'm not able to be uh, there with all of you uh, in person, uh, but I am delighted to join you all virtually from Cody, Wyoming today. And I just really appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you about these incredibly uh, important artists and to just give you some of their stories behind their art. Uh, so hopefully if all is well, without further ado, do, uh, we will go ahead and get started. So. For the Kiowa Nation, as for many of the indigenous nations that called the Americas home, the early 20th century was a time of drastic cultural changes and adaptation, adaptations in technology, print media, language, fashion, education, and social and sacred traditions. Patronizing attitudes towards Native peoples at the beginning of the 20th century informed the United States government's public policy. Allotment of the Kiowa Reservation eroded the tribe's communal lifestyle, discouraged cultural attachment, and enforced assimilation policies upon Kiowa families. Children were forcibly educated in Indian boarding schools 
and stripped of their language and tribal identity. Some religious ceremonies were banned outright, while others faced serious opposition from reservation administrators. So thus many religious and ceremonial ways were practiced and preserved in secrets by select families and communities. However, this time was also marked by the appearance of growing ranks of native writers, ethnographic informants, and visual artists who worked to construct alternative views countering settler colonial beliefs that native societies were living fossils of an obsolete stage of social progress. One such group of vi native visual artists is the collective known as the Kiowa Six. And they led a resurgence in Na American Indian art across the nation and in Europe during the 1920s. These artists who we see pictured here, James Ochaya, Jack Hokia, Spencer Asa, Bogota, Lois Smokey, Stephen Mapoke, and Monroe Satoke painted watercolor images of Kiowa community life, both past and present. Painting is a vital part of Kiowa culture, and the tribe developed a unique artistic aesthetic dating back centuries to a time when painters widely used earth paints and plant dyes on the skins of animals to create symbolism for their war shields, tribal regalia, calendars, and painted lodges. Prior to the 20th century, such paintings were often autobiographical, with men creating them to depict their accomplishments in battle, to recall important life events, and to, and to depict images related to the spiritual power that they sought to become successful warriors and providers for their families. The tradition of painting on paper became established in the late 19th century. And while images of active warfare and military victory diminish, courting scenes, dancers, and other depictions of everyday life became more prominent. Continuing into the 20th century, Kiowa men and women used the arts to represent new ways of understanding and representing Kiowa identity that resonated with their changed circumstances. The artworks of the Kiowa Six are an extension of this long history and artistic heritage. They were influenced particularly by an older generation of Kiowa artists that included the well-known ledger artist James Silverhorn, great uncle of the artist Stephen Mapope. And much like Silverhorn and other earlier artists, the Kiowa Six painted from a broadly autobiographical experience that followed the cultural and spiritual contours of their own lives depicting images of the Native American church and powwows, among many other subjects. Community Kiowa, or Kiowa community life, excuse me, both past and present, is at the center of the paintings created by the Kiowa Six. In fact, the basis of their art was their ongoing involvement with their community. And while some paintings are nostalgic in subject and, and depict themes and practices from the past, the majority present contemporary scenes witnessed by the artists. According to the scholar, Lydia L. Wyckoff, today the Kiowa community remembers the Kiowa Six for their singing, dancing, and participation in cultural events as much as for their painting. Lee Monet, Lee Monet Satoke, son of Monroe Satoke, spoke to this connection, saying of the Kiowa Six's art that, quote, these artistic styles are all related to the tribal songs and dances. To me, it's all the same. These guys, the Kiowa Five, they could sing, they could dance and paint. They could speak their own language. Everything evolved around the same thing, the culture and their heritage. To them, it was just natural." End quote. While it grew out of their rich artistic heritage, the Kiowa Six's art was modern in style as well, featuring flat colors, clear outlines, and sinuous curves. They worked in gouache, an opaque watercolor that they thickly applied to fine watercolor paper. The flat decorative style they worked in became known as the quote unquote traditional style that most people identified as contemporary Native American painting during the first half of the 20th century. One could argue that the story of the Kiowa Six's careers as official artists began in 1914, when Hokia, Asa, and Mapope 
were given art instructions at St. Patrick's Mission School in Anadarko, Oklahoma, by the Choctaw nun, Sister Olivia Taylor. However, it is important to note that all of the Kiowa Six were creating artworks prior to their schooling. From about 1918 until about 1922, Susan Peters, an Indian service field matron, gave informal art lessons to some of the artists, and she went on to promote the careers of the Kiowa Six. With the assistance of Lewis Ware, a Kiowa politician in the Oklahoma State Legislature, Peter reached, Peters reached out to Oscar Jacobson, a well-known artist and director of the University of Oklahoma School of Art, and she reached out to him regarding the Kiowa Six's paintings. Soon after seeing their paintings, Jacobson arranged for the artist to attend the university. Between 1927 and 1929, all six artists, including Smokey, received instructions from Edith Mayhir and Jacobson at the university. They were supported by full scholarships and stipends and were enrolled in what has been described as quote unquote special courses, which means that they were segregated from the rest of the students. Jacobson did this in order to, or did this to prevent the quote unquote authenticity of the Kiowa Six's art from being contaminated by Western influences. Meher and Jacobson gave no formal instructions to the artists, only criticism and encouragement. As Ida Jones, daughter of Spencer Asis, explained, quote, they just let the Kiowa Six artists go. Here's your paints and go ahead and paint. That's what they came up with, their own style, you know. They weren't shown how to do it or how to put their colors together. They just let them go. It was their own idea. They weren't encouraged to do a certain thing, just their own ideas to put something down on a piece of paper, end quote. In 1928, Jacobson organized the artworks of Asa, Mapope, Hokia, Smokey, and Satoke into an exhibition that toured the United States and Europe. The tour culminated in a show of the paintings at the 1929 International Folk Art Congress in Prague. That same year, the French publisher C. Sedzwicki published a portfolio of prints of what was then known as the Kiowa Five, titled Kiowa Indian Art, Watercolor Paintings in Color by the Indians of Oklahoma, the portfolio was published in, edition, in an edition of 750. Each edition contained 29 prints of watercolors by Asa, Mapope, Hokia, Smokey, and Satoke, reproduced as hand-colored pouchoir or stenciled prints. In the 1930s, several of the artists painted murals in Oklahoma and Washington, D.C. under the auspices of the federal government. For the Kiowa Six, Art was a vehicle to obtain their education and pursue what they loved, which was painting and telling the stories of Kiowa people. Spencer Asa was born near Carnegie, Oklahoma in 1906. He was a grandson and son of Buffalo medicine men, and he grew up in an environment filled with Kiowa ritual and traditional history. As I noted earlier, he was one of the artists who attended St. Patrick's Mission School, where he received art lessons from Sister Olivia Taylor, and he eventually studied at the o University of Oklahoma alongside his fellow Kiowa Six artists. An accomplished singer, dancer, silver worker, baseball player, and painter, Issa is best remembered for the attention to cultural veracity reflected in his paintings of Kiowa life and culture. The skillful artistic representation stemmed from first-hand experience. Asa participated in the peyote ceremonies of the Native American Church and as a member of the Ohoma Society, a Kiowa ceremonial society. And as that member of that society, he sang and danced regularly at gatherings and powwows, including multiple visits to the Gallup intertribal ceremonials. Utilizing his skills as a silver worker, he also crafted regalia pieces such as bustles and headdresses worn during dance performances. Thus, Asa was involved in every stage of the artistic process, 
from creation to ceremony to illustration, with his paintings accurately capturing the detail, color, and movement of dances and rituals. Because of his role as a competitive dancer, many of Asa's artworks depict figures in dance positions, such as the figure we see here in his painting, Dance of the Buffalo. Depicted as full figures, often in profile view, his dancers are animated and show movement and are accentuated with black and white areas that enhance the dancers' forms and the colors of their regalia. As we can see in self-portrait dancing here on the left, his line drawings and paintings were meticulous and exact replications of the feather work and regalia appropriate for the occasion. We can see this meticulous attention to detail and the way he clearly defines the different types of feathers used in his regalia. The title, Self-Portrait Dancing, reminds us that Asa himself was a skilled dancer, and his experience as a dancer informs the exacting detail he includes in such paintings. The painting here on the right, Contest Dance, speaks to the changes the Kiowa experienced during the early 20th century. At that time, Kiowa dances, ceremonies, and spiritual practices were banned by the U.S. federal government. However, it was also during this time that powwows began developing, and the Kiowa Six's artworks accurately reflect patterns and trends in the development of powwows as a major social force in Native American communities. The painting Contest Dance depicts two Kiowa men in mid-motion, performing what is sometimes referred to as the war dance. One contemporary form of the war dance is now commonly known as the men's fancy dance, one of the major powwow contest dances. Asa's painting highlights the key elements of early fancy dance regalia, which included ornate headdresses made from deer tail hair or porcupine hair adorned with two eagle feathers, jewel-toned breechcloths and bustles made of eagle wings, as well as fully beaded accessories, including suspenders, wrist cuffs, and armbands. The specificity in Asa's paintings underscores that for Asa, this was not just about authenticity, but also about precision in creating images that were specific in the representation of dance as a form of knowledge. And he passed this knowledge on to younger generations of artists when he served as an instructor, instructor at the Fort Sill and River Schools. He explained that the students, quote, need to know the dances to get their right, to get the right positions for their figures and to get the clothes right, end quote, thereby instilling in his students the integral role that Kiowa cultural knowledge played in the creation of his art. Stephen Mupope, was the oldest and most well-known member of the Kiowa Six. Some art historians and scholars argue that he was the best artist technically of the group. He was born on August 27, 1898, on the Kiowa Reservation in what was then known as Indian Territory, and his childhood was deeply ingrained with Kiowa lifeways, as his grandmother taught him Kiowa traditions. Mapope received early artistic instruction from Sister Olivia at St. Patrick's Mission School, and also from Susan Peters, the Indian service field matron who served as a mentor and promoter of the Kiowa Six artists prior to their attendance at the University of Oklahoma. As I noted earlier, Mapope was the great nephew of two Kiowa artists, one of whom, was, one of whom Silverhorn, a, was a distinguished Kiowa hide and ledger uh, book painter. In fact, Mapope named Silverhorn as his first great art teacher, and the second he named as Sister Olivia. Recognizing their nephew's artistic ability, the great uncles taught Mapope how to paint on tan hides, and from their work, Mapope acquired a wealth of cultural tradition and knowledge. In 1916, Silverhorn invited a teenage Mapope to a gathering of men who repainted Chief Duasan's historic battle teepee, replete with depictions of heroic war deeds. Late in his life, Mapope recalled this invitation as his highest honor. Though he concentrated on painting, 
Mapoke was also a champion dancer and singer, a flute player, and a member of the Ohoma Society of the Kiowa. In fact, Mapoke is recognized as one of the first members of the Kiowa community to fancy war dance and is credited with introducing the dance style in Southwest Oklahoma. During the 1930s, Mapoke, along with Ochaya and Asa, dominated the war dance category and dance competitions, including those held at the Gallup Intertribal Ceremonials and the American Indian Expo Exposition. His paintings, such as War Dance, which we see here on the right, and Eagle Dance, which we see here on the left, reflect his experience as a dancer. We see dancers poised mid-dance and adorned in elaborate regalia, which Mapoke renders in painstaking detail. Such dance scenes were the primary subjects of his paintings. Now, Mapoke's painting here on the right, Procession, is representative of a different side of his oeuvre. The painting demonstrates a continuity with pre-reservation artistic traditions and points to how Mapoke was inspired by ledger book artists such as his uncle Silverhorn. Rather than depicting a solitary figure or a small group of figures as he did in his dance, paintings of dancers, Mapoke depicts a parade of riders, both male and female. According to one of his descendants, Mapoke represented himself and his wife in the painting. He is the lead figure here, distinguishable by his regalia and shield. His wife rides next to him. Such autobiographical narrative paintings are a part of long traditions in Plains cultures where historical narratives are a part of the visual arts. Mapope's close attention to the detail in the regalia of the figures distinguishes them as individuals, underscoring the fact that Mapope, like his fellow artists, sought to tell the stories of his Kiowa community. Mapope's primary occupations throughout his life were dancing and painting, and they served as his primary means of supporting his family. He continued to paint and dance until the end of his life, and just as his grandmother and great uncles passed their knowledge to him, he became an agent of cultural knowledge, teaching and mentoring younger generations of Kiowa men. Born in Western Oklahoma in 1907, Bogota, Lois Smokey, was the only female member of the Kiowa Six, and she too came from a family of artists. Both her mother and grandmother were renowned bead workers, and they are still remembered in the Anadarko, Oklahoma community for their skills. Smokey attended several Indian schools throughout her childhood and teenage years, including St. Patrick's Mission School, and she credited her artistic discovery to Susan Peters, Sister Olivia Taylor, and others at St. Patrick's Mission School. One of her other earlier teachers was Mrs. Willie Bays Lane, an art instructor who lived in Chickasaw, Oklahoma. Smokey was one of the original five of the Kiowa Six artists to take art classes at the University of Oklahoma. Her time at OU was short, however. She stayed for only one semester in the fall of 1927, and when she left the program, James Otaya took her place. Because she was a woman, Smokey had to obtain permission from her family to attend OU, and her mother had to accompany her as a chaperone. During her time at OU, she also faced some resentment from the other artists because she was a woman practicing a traditional male form of figural painting. The painted figural work Smokey created while at OU proved to be both representative of her strong artistic lineage and revolutionary for the native female artists who followed her. Seminal art historian Dr. Mary Jo Watson explained that, quote, Smokey's participation in the Kiowa Six marked the first time in Oklahoma Indian history that a female had studied painting and painted the human figure. Traditionally, women had only painted geometric or abstract figures. Because she was the first Indian woman in Oklahoma to step outside of the accepted role of women to paint subjects formerly exclusive to Plains Native men, she served as a model to later generations of Native women artists who wished to do the same. 
Her images, very similar to those created by Kiowa men, also celebrated the culture and the people. End quote. By painting images of Kiowa women, children, and men, such as the painting we see, or see here on the right entitled Courtship, Smokey consciously broke with the customary ideas concerning the role of Plains women artists. Kiowa and Tonga scholar Jordan Porman Cocker states that Smokey's paintings, quote, focus on family relationships from a female perspective and provide an autoethnographic narrative of her experiences of Kiowa life, end quote. In her paintings, Smokey often depicted women in traditional women, uh, depicted women in traditional Kiowa women's buckskin dresses, sometimes depicting them with children, like in these two paintings here, Kiowa family on the left and lullaby on the right. Kiowa family, Smokey's only painting included in the 1929 Kiowa Indian art portfolio, depicts a Kiowa family of noble stabbit noble status, evident from their regalia, adornments, and beadwork. The family's finery and regalia dates back to an era of Kiowa abundance before hunting and subsistence living was banned by the U.S. government in the 1870s. Smokey's status as a noted beadworker is evident in the meticulously rendered beadwork of the family's regalia. As explained by Kiowa scholar Jeton Pahot, Quote, in the early 20th century, beadwork possessed multiple social, cultural, and economic facets. It also illustrated the significance of social relationships in constructing uh, Kiowa identities. Women made items that created and represented family and community bonds. End quote. By carefully detailing the intricate designs of the beadwork on the regalia of the mother, daughter, and son that we see in Kiowa family, Smokey represented the high status and prosperity of the family. In Lullaby, we see a mother holding her child in its cradle board and lifting the child up towards the sky. The mother's lips are parted in song. Cradle boards have a long history and broad distribution among the indigenous peoples of North America, serving practical, aesthetic, and spiritual purposes. Producing a Kiowa cradle requires a considerable investment of time and energy by the maker and is offered as a prayer for long life for the child. Beating a cradle is an act of respect and celebration undertaken by loving relatives to welcome a new member to their extended family. In depicting a seemingly private moment between a mother and child, Lullaby provides us with an intimate perspective on Kiowa motherhood and childhood. Smoky pain, Smokey's paintings like these two here are some of the earliest examples of a mother and child subject matter in native, a modern Native American painting. After departing OU, Smokey continued her own artistic practice through beadwork and teaching her sons how to paint. And in doing so, she sustained her family's artistic tradition and asserted herself as a strong agent of cultural transmission within her Kiowa community all while paving the way for future generations of Native female artists. Jack Hokia was born in Western Oklahoma in 1902. Orphaned in infancy, he was raised by his grandmother. He came from a distinguished line of artists. Like Mapope, Hokia counted the artist Silverhorn among his relatives. And Hokia developed his art at an early age. Like other members of the Kiowa Six, Hokia attended St. Patrick's Mission School, where he was educated through the eighth grade. At St. Patrick's, Sister Olivia, al Olivia allowed Hokia to draw various scenes, mostly of his own choosing, on the school's blackboard. He later took lessons from the Euro-American artist Willie Baz Lane, and those early artistic experiences helped prepare Hokia for his more formal training art at OU. In his paintings, Hokia's subjects were informed by his Southern Plains heritage and include dancing and other ceremonial occasions. Hokia himself was a very skilled dancer and he frequently participated in powwows, competitive dances and ceremonies. 
His personal experiences as a dancer informed his paintings, such as War Dancer, in which we see a careful rendering of the dancer's regalia. A layering of different compositional elements, such as the various aspects of the dancer's regalia, creates a sense of depth in the otherwise flat composition, which adds to the sense of motion created by the dancer's bent limbs. Around 1930, the male artists of the Kiowa Six began to travel and work widely in New Mexico, and they began participating in the Gallup and her tribal ceremonials as dancers or as singers. This was both an opportunity to promote their dance, to promote their paintings and to, uh, and to dance. On one such trip, Hokia met Maria Martinez, the noted Pueblo Potter. He ultimately lived for a decade at San Ildefonso as her adopted son. His presence in New Mexico helped build a lasting friendship and artistic exchange between Plains and Pueblo's peoples, and it created a synthesis between early modern Pueblo painting and the Kiowa Six style. Here we have two other paintings by Hokia, Buffalo Dance and Kiowa Mother and Child. In Buffalo Dance, we see two dancers shown in a blank, ambiguous space. Like the paintings by his fellow Kiowa artists, we again see a close attention to detail in Hokia's rendering of the dancer's regalia. If you're able to look closely, each dancer has unique regalia. You can see differences in their belts, arm and leg bands, and the designs on their spears. One could almost assume that this was a front and back view of a single dancer, but the differing regalia individualizes the dancers. This symmetrical composition featuring two figures is one that Hokia used frequently in his depictions of Kiowa dances. Although somewhat static because of the flat, flat application of the paint, the dancers are shown in motion, with movement indicated by their twisting bodies, bent arms and legs, and the differing placement of their feet. Much like Asa, we see Hokia's experience as a dancer informing his painting. In Kaiwa Mother and Child, Hokia depicts a mother and child, or perhaps even an older sister and a younger sibling, in profile, seated together in again a blank, ambiguous space. The figure's seated forms create a strong tri triangle in the center of the composition. We see here a prime example of the bright jewel tone colors that Hokia preferred to use in his paintings. And we see this reflected in the figure's bright red and rich blue clothing. There is some indication of texture created by the patterning in the beaded collar worn by the child. The mother appears to be wearing a similar beaded collar or necklace, perhaps an indication of their kinship. Although depictions of such intimate familial relationships were commonplace in Smokey's artworks, they were less common in the artworks of her male colleagues, making this a unique painting among Hokia's work. Although he painted infrequently in his later years, Hokia continued to dance, and he spent several years touring with Tom Holt's Wild West show. And today, he is remembered for his passion for dancing and acute attention to detail which are clearly reflected within his paintings. A gifted painter, as well as a beadworker and singer, Monroe Satoke was born near Saddle Mountain in Oklahoma Territory on September 19, 1904. He was the son of Satoke, or Hunting Horse, a Kiowa scout for General George Armstrong Custer, and his father nourished a young Monroe on Kiowa culture. The knowledge passed on to Satoke from his father resulted in very culturally specific paintings. His early art instructions included the classes taught by Susan Peters and later by art teacher Willie Baz Lane. He attended Bacon College in Muskogee, Oklahoma, intermittently between 1919 and 1923, before beginning to attend the University of Oklahoma in the spring of 1927. Throughout his life, Satoke was chief singer for Kiowa ceremonials for a number of years, and he memorized songs from many different tribes. 
Music plays a central role in Kiowa culture, with songs situated at the center of community life and social relationships. It is clear that Satoke understood and embraced this aspect of Kiowa culture and history when we look at such paintings as the love call pictured here. The simple scene features a man playing a carved wooden flute while a woman stands just behind him. Kiowa origin stories reference the cosmic powers of the flute and drawing a flutist play partner to them. And courting songs were prominently used in Kiowa communities prior to the 20th century. That Satoke chose to depict such a scene in which song serves an important role underscores the centrality of music to Kiowa social life. In the 1930s, Satoke unfortunately developed tuberculosis and was increasingly sick. During this time, he joined the Native American church and practiced the peyote faith. And his art started to reflect his face, his faith, and his paintings, such as Peyote Man that we see here on the left, began to represent the symbolism of the Native American church and peyoteism. Peyote Man depicts a Kiowa roadman, a leader in the Native American church, holding a fan of waterbird feathers and dressed in formal Kiowa attire that includes a blue and red Native American church robe. Regarding his grandfather's faith, Monroe Satoke, the grandson of the artist Satoke, once stated, quote, my grandfather said, quote, there are two things I learned in church, humility, how to be humble, and how to pray. He learned those two things in the teepee. They, the old people, lived a plain and simple life. Nothing was rushed. It was a good life, end quote. Satoke can continue to work through his sickness, refusing to let the tuberculosis get the best of him. The painting here that we see on the right, Portrait of an Indian Man, is a self-portrait Satoke painted about a year before his death. As you can see in this painting, he departed from the Kiowa style of flat painting and delved instead into realism and modernism, which is evident in his use of shadows and shading to convey depth and dimension. The visible brushstrokes give the painting its painterly quality, which stands in strong contrast to the clear, concise, controlled brushworks Satoke used to create paintings like Peyote Man and The Love Call. Jordan Poorman Cocker argues that in this self-portrait, quote, we glimpse the artist's desire to depict his personal experience. His clothing and adornments by which he was known and recognized speak to the intersections between the indigenous community and the newly formed state of Oklahoma. Many of Satoke's paintings celebrate religious ideals and traditions while simultaneously reconciling his experiences with colonial history." End quote. In 1934, Satoke was commissioned by the Oklahoma Historical Society to paint a series of murals in which he featured numerous personal images including religious symbols and two of his family shields. He worked on these murals until his death from tuberculosis in 1937, when he became the first member of the Kiowa Six to pass away. The last artist to join the cohort of the Kiowa Six was James Ochaya. He was born in 1906 near the present community of Medicine Park, which is located just outside of the city of Lawton. His grandfather was the famous Kiowa chief, Satant, and he was also the grandson of Red Teepee, a well-known medicine man and talented artist. Ochaya began creating art at a young age, and although he received art lessons throughout his schooling, he pushed back on the chronologies that state his formal art career began with his studies at the University of Oklahoma. Regarding this, Ochaya once said, quote, now that was prior to the time that I eat, that I eat that I even heard about Oscar Jacobson or Mrs. Susan Peters. I was already selling artwork. By George, a long, long time before I came to school, I was already selling artwork, end quote. His early art projects centered on recording and preserving Kiowa visual culture and included creating and documenting beadwork patterns, painting shield designs, or even visions. 
We see the influence of his earlier projects in his 1930 painting, Kiowa Buffalo Dancer. Ochaya's study and documentation of beadwork designs is apparent in the carefully rendered and intricate details of the dancer's regalia, including the dancer's cuffs, leggings, bison robe, and headdress. Like the other members of the Kiowa Six, Ochaya used flat planes of color, creating a strong contrast between the neutral colors of black, white, and tan, and the bright, vibrant colors of pink, teal, yellow, purple, and orange. The dancer dominates the composition, filling the entire picture space. Ochaya served in the U.S. Coast Guard during World War II, and after the war, he worked as a teacher, illustrator, and museum curator. His later artwork was devoted primarily to the Native American church, and we see that represented here in his 1937 painting, Peyote Bird. The Native American church itself combines elements of Native beliefs, Christianity, and, pe and peyoteism. And the church's ceremonies at this early time were a way to incorporate religious traditions being destroyed by government agents and Christian missionaries. The story of the Native American church and its associated artistic traditions is one of cultural survival, social adaptation, and moral revitalization that Ochaya, along with his fellow Kiowa Six artists, chose to paint peyote imagery was significant. Their paintings were considered some of the first quote unquote fine art that circulated as American Indian art, and they made peyote imagery a part of the aesthetic of American Indian painting in very public and prominent ways. Sometime after World War II, Ochaya participated in the creation of a new Kiowa calendar count, and he came to see his art as a record that preserved traditional Kiowa history. One such painting is Indians at Work, which Ochaya painted in 1939. In comparison to other paintings by the Kiowa Six, Indians at Work features a slightly more complex composition due to the number of figures and the inclusion of background details. This is a narrative painting depicting a group of five adults and one child in which three of the figures are at work. Unlike many artworks by the Kiowa Six, we have an obvious Im indication of location with the inclusion of teepees in the background. Again, we see Ochaya's close attention to detail and the way he rendered the headdress, the shield being prepared, the details on the figure's clothing, and the details on the teepees. The scene seemingly depicts the everyday life of Kiowa communities prior to colonization, thus fulfilling the role that Ochaya had sought for his art, which was that of a record preserving Kiowa history. The works of the Kiowa Six provide strong visual testimony of the resiliency and creativeness that Native American communities have employed in the continued practice of their social, religious, and political lives. In fact, the Kiowa Six inspired artists to paint using their own American Indian identities as a foundational backdrop. Their artistic style remained dominant in American Indian art until the 1960s, when an artistic renaissance em emerged and encouraged Native artists to move away from painting romantic images of Native peoples. Through the Kiowa Six's artworks and their interpretation of tribal life, American Indian artistic style was reborn and perpetuated in the Native art world. Their art stands as a visual language, articulating Kiowa tribal identity with each brushstroke. And to this day, it continues to inspire artists to tell the stories of their peoples. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, Dr. Ashley. If you have any questions and you have a cell phone, you can scan the QR code when I get off the screen again. So in case if you have any questions or if the audience here wants to ask any, we can take that, give back to Ashley.
And I guess I have a question for Ashley. <laughs> um, Dr. Ashley. Um, out of the Kiowa six, which I know you went through each one, which one was the most in your eyes as an art historian, the most inspirational to contemporary native painters today? It really depends on the contemporary uh, painters. Um, several have been inspired by the Kiowa Six just as a group. Um, I guess probably the most inspiring would be, um, you could argue would be Bogota or Lois Smokey, um, just because of the fact that she did, you know, break with um, traditional gender roles and really broke into the field of figural painting. And I know there are many, many uh, women artists who came after her who credit her with giving them the confidence to uh, um, go after and, you know, create figural painting for themselves. Uh, I'm think of uh, the artist Ruthie Bylock Jones comes to mind. Um, and there were several others in particular in Oklahoma who were very inspired by her. Um, she uh, is probably the artist with the least amount of artworks that were uh, created just because of the fact that she was at uh, OU for such a short time. Um, but despite that, um, her her artworks remain some of the most important and inspiring because of the fact that it, it presented, you know, a female perspective of, of Kiowa life and, and community and particularly her viewpoints and depictions of Kiowa motherhood and childhood and that relationship between mother and child. Thank you. Another question, did the artist face any challenges while attending school outside of Smokey? Um, in their, when they talked about going to school, uh, several of them actually had really positive uh, things to say. Uh, I think, I believe it was Mapope in particular, uh, talked about uh, enjoying playing uh, football and different sports with some of his classmates. Um, and uh, because uh, Smokey had to be accompanied by her mother, uh, they actually had a house off campus uh, where uh, they all lived and worked together, and it kind of created um, this Kiowa community on campus. And so they were still able to retain that connection to their community and their culture. And so that helped uh, them with their experiences and adjusting to uh, life as a student at OU as well. Thank you. And who are some current day artists inspired by the Kiowa Six? Uh, Ruthie Bilek Jones is still uh, living and creating art. Um, of course, I'm completely blanking on his name. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I know there are several other artists, particularly Oklahoma artists, uh, who still paint uh, in kind of that Kiowa Six style. Um, I will whoever if that came in online uh i will gladly email the, the name of the artist once i remember them i feel so bad i can't remember his name right now uh but there are several uh who who reference uh, who reference their style in particular and there are of course uh many other plains artists who are inspired by ledger art uh very similar to the kiowa six um uh john pepion is one that comes to mind um, and there are many artists who are now creating their uh, own, you know, present day versions of, of ledger art as well. And so uh, their work continues to inspire uh, artists in a lot of different ways. Thank you. And a follow up from the Oklahoma uh, University, Oklahoma State. Um, did the Kiowa Six take other college courses like math, literature or just art? Not that I know of. They were primarily there to uh, take their art classes and were primarily students of the, the School of Art. Um, and so in my studies of them, I haven't really come across uh, them taking uh, 
those other types of classes, math, science, et cetera, uh, they were really there to, to focus on their art. And that was one of the primary reasons that Jacobson invited them to come to the university was to, to be in his art school. Thank you. And do you know of any of the Kiowa Six family still making art? Yes, uh, Stephen Mapope's uh, granddaughter, Vanessa Jennings, is a noted beadwork artist. Um, and uh, I believe some of uh, Monroe Sutoke's uh, descendants are practicing art as well. And do you have any ideas how many works are painted by the Kiowa Six and where are they at now? Total? I, I'm not sure um, because they all painted you know, varying amounts. Um, Stephen Mapope probably painted the most. Uh, he was probably the most prolific of the artists. Um, I believe the count for uh, Lois Smokey's painting was an estimated uh, 50 paintings. Uh, the rest of uh, her male colleagues, I would say the, the paintings probably number more in the hundreds. Um, some of them may still be within family collections. Um, otherwise, I know the Gilcrease Museum of Art in Tulsa, Oklahoma has a really strong collection of both uh, pouchoir prints from the Kiowa Indian Art Portfolio, as well as originals uh, from the Kiowa Six. Uh, the Philbrook Museum of Art in Tulsa, Oklahoma has a strong collection as well. Uh, the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art uh, in Norman, Oklahoma, of course, located at the University of Oklahoma, has a strong collection. And then uh, there are museums throughout the country as well that have them. Uh, I believe the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian has some. Um, uh, and then off the top of my head, I can't think of others, but I know they are they are located in museums throughout the nation. How many pieces we have here? We have the 30 prints from. And. I guess this is a question also, uh, Dr. Ashley, do you have any specific knowledge about the time and pieces in our collection that we sent the couple images to you from what? From what I can tell uh, looking at them, I would really love to see them in person because they look like they are in incredible condition. Uh, but from what I can tell, it looks like you have, as you said, you have the 30. It looks like it's uh, one of the portfolios of the 1929 um, pouchoir prints that were published in France. And so those are actually completed sets like that are actually very rare now. Um, only a handful of institutions throughout the, uh, the nation actually have uh, completed sets like that. Uh, the Western History Collections at the University of Oklahoma has two, um, and they are the one of the places off the top of my head that I can think of that has them. Otherwise, a lot of case in a lot of cases, um, it's just individual uh, mm. of the prints uh, because the portfolios were oftentimes dispersed. And so museums will have uh, if they don't have a complete collection, they may have a handful of of those pouchoir prints. Um, and so if it's if it seems like what I think it is, uh, you are very lucky to have a completed set. I think of what you just said, Dr. Ashley, I think they are because I know on the back of them it has. Um, we got them in 1936. That's about. Yeah, as much and, information and, as. Yeah. And as far as I know, the the edition of 750 that was done in 1929 was the only edition like those were the only ones that were done. So. I know we've I did find in going through McCarthy before we moved over to the new building of the Center for the Arts, I did find a couple where it did state this was the addition of 99 from the 750. So okay. yeah. um, I will make sure to <laughs> hold on to that. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> and was tempera paint on paper common among non-native artists or was it just the Kiowa Six? Tempera uh, was a really popular paint uh, early on, uh, kind of before the advent of oil painting uh, and such. Um, it it was um, 
very similar to the paints that were kind of used on high painting over ledger book painting. And so it was one that uh, the Kiowa Six worked in quite frequently. And then, of course, uh, they also painted in gouache, that really thick, heavy, opaque watercolor as well. Um, although they also worked in, in other mediums as well, drawing, ink. Um, as I said, they painted uh, a lot of murals as well, which would kind of be like a fresco-esque um, situation. And so, um, and then of course, Satoke, uh, had the his self portrait was painted in oil and so they did uh you know test out and use a lot of different um varieties of medium uh but the the wash and tempura and paper were uh kind of the medium of of choice and part of that was because that was what their their teachers jacobson peters uh and other teachers like that really encouraged them to use those mediums as well Thank you, and I have a long question. <laughs> was there a sense among the Kiowa Six that the arts were broadly integrated beyond the imagery of dance and beadwork? Were they unusually diverse in their range as painters, dancers, and singers? Repeat one more time. Yes. Was there a sense among the Kiowa Six that the arts were broadly integrated beyond the imagery of dance and beadwork? Were they unusually diverse in their range as painters, dancers, and singers? Um, in terms of their own personal lives, their, their practices as artists and as beadworkers, singers, dancers, um, was very integrated. Um, and as I said, their, their artwork was very much informed by their own personal experiences. Um, images of dances were something that sold very well to non-native um, uh, patrons. And so uh, that was one reason that they did focus on, on you know, painting images of dances a lot. But it was also very central to you know, their own lives and to Kiowa culture. And so that was one reason that those uh, images and depictions were very important. Um, it was really, you know, as I said, Kiowa community life and all that was involved with it was very central to what they painted. Um, and uh, let's see here. They did uh, paint uh, images outside of those scenes, uh, depictions more so of everyday life. Um, Stephen Mapope in particular, oftentimes uh, later on in his career, would paint more uh, complicated scenes very similar to James Ochaya, uh, showing everyday life within uh, you know, a Kiowa village or community. And so they did branch out beyond that, uh, but particularly in their early years, uh, and especially under when they were studying with Jacobson, uh, they really focused in on those uh, depictions of dances and ceremonies and such that um, you know, kind of really sold well to, to non-native audiences. Um, and so they did have a, a wide range uh, that, they, that they painted and depicted. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. And here's an easy one. What okay. is your favorite, what is your favorite painting from the Kiowa Six and why? Oh, oh, that's a tough one. Um boy. I mean, they're all amazing and beautiful uh, in their own right. And when you get the chance to see them in person, uh, especially their that meticulous attention to detail that I kept going back to is, is just incredible. The detail that they were able to capture using watercolor was incredible. Um, I, again, probably uh, am drawn to Lois Smokey's uh, paintings. Um, just because it, it represents, you know, that, that different aspect of, of Kiowa, um, that female perspective uh, of Kiowa life and culture and um, her rendering of beadwork like in Kiowa family with the, the mother and the, the two children is, is just incredible. And, and her depiction of the relationship between, you know, mother and child is um, just, you know, one that is so 
sweet and you know one that I think resonates with a lot of people so I just I really enjoy her artwork I, I like all of their artwork I mean it's all amazing but um I guess Smokey in particular would probably be my favorite artist thank you and do you know when was the last piece created by one of the six and who was it if you know Ooh. I'm not sure to be honest that's a really good question um they all continue painting until the end of their lives um and so some of the works were created in you know 1950s 1960s um but I, I don't know off the top of my head <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> And then I have one last one from in here uh, from the CFA. I think similar to the Kiowa Six, Steve Paul Judge depicts his own native life by his blending of pop culture like Star Wars and Marvel. But what but would you say the original Kiowa Six works was similar in symbolism like Judge? In a way, I guess, uh, Stephen Paul Judd, who's a fantastic uh, artist working today. Uh, I love his work. I'm familiar with it. Um, it was definitely a, a blending of, um, you know, their culture and, as I said, their changed circumstances, um, you know, living through, you know, colonization and assimilation practices and um, the like. And so, especially for Kiowa, you know, insiders, uh, it does hold important cultural symbolism um, and, um, you know, they're able to look at the paintings and see, you know, the representation of, you know, that relationship between mother and child and, and Smokey's work and, um, you know, the peyote symbolism represented in the, the works that reference the Native American church by Ochaya and uh, Satoke and uh, the others, um, it's all embedded in there. It might not be, you know, quite the same use of, of what we think of as pop culture, um, but there is still important cultural knowledge uh, contained within those works. Thank you. And I guess I have a question that sh for a general question. Um, how important is art history, whether it's just in the Indonesian cultures or just cultures nationwide or even around the world that students should be paying attention to? Uh, art history, I think, is is so important. It, it's not just, you know, the study of the artworks themselves. But it really digs into, you know, the historical context, the cultural context for the works, social, political. It touches on uh, so many different aspects uh, of a person, of a society, of a culture. And you can learn so much from studying art history um, because it will open your eyes to, you know, history and you know things that you didn't know um and also deepen your knowledge of um you know events or peoples or cultures within history as well and so art is has been a part of human you know societies for as long as you know humans have been around um and so really it there's just so much information and knowledge embedded within art um, that I think it just really art history in particular offers a great opportunity to learn so much about the world that um, other disciplines might not um, that might not make that connection. And it offers a unique perspective in that way. Thank you. And. I don't think there was any other questions. Again, thank you, Dr. Ashley, for participating with us virtually. And I want to say also thank you to Dr. Kelly for collaborating with us in the art department over this. We will have to send to you, um, Ashley, the walkthrough 
of the Kiowa Six prints here in, at Valley City State University. Yes, I would love that. So. <laughs> Kelly said she'll Facebook Live it for you. Sounds good. So again, thank you. Thank you to everybody who has attended today. There is a small reception afterwards. And again, I hope you stick around, look at the prints. If you have any questions, please let me know and stay tuned for November for our senior art exhibitions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was a pleasure. Thank you.